Well, hello everybody and welcome to another episode. I've been shooting one or two Fuji X cameras lately and the more I shoot them, the more I like them. I began with the X-T10, a lovely little camera. I loved its colours and its film simulations and its small form factor. I shot the X-T1, that's a beautiful camera. I really love that camera too. Well, today I've got another extraordinary little Fuji X camera to show you. And that is this one. It's the Fujifilm X-T2. It has a new APS-C or at least it was new, X-Trans 3 sensor with 24 megapixels compared to 16 megapixels for the X-T1. It has shutter speeds from one second to one eight thousandth of a second and B plus B and T settings. It's got dual card slots, a magnesium alloy body. It's fully weather sealed. It shoots all the wonderful Fujifilm lenses and because it's a mirrorless camera, it'll shoot pretty much any lens ever made. Its layout is broadly similar to that of the X-T1. It has all these beautiful dials on the top plate and exposure compensation, shutter speed and an ISO dial. And it's very reminiscent of the old film SLRs that we used to use some years ago. And in fact, these Fuji X cameras are intended to give as far as possible the experience or a similar experience to using those old film cameras. But they do provide all the convenience of digital too, which is absolutely fantastic. Let's have a closer look at this one. So here is the beautiful little Fujifilm X-T2 and let's begin by looking at the top plate so we can see that the ISO dial is here on the photographer's left. It runs from 200 to 12,800 ISO, that's double that of the X-T1. It has a low ISO setting which equates to 100 and the high settings are 25,000 and 50,000 but they are noisy and should be used really in emergency only. Fujifilm cameras are renowned for their low noise capability and this one gives pretty clean images up to 12,800 and it's certainly entirely usable up to 6,400. There is a button in the centre to lock that dial. It works like a ballpoint pen so if I push it, it clicks and we're now locked. And if I push it again, it clicks and we are unlocked so you can move it to whatever position that you want to. That's different to the X-T1. The X-T1 had a button that you had to push and hold to change that setting. And this one is easier. It just clicks in and out and uh, I, I think that is an improvement. It does make things easier. There's another similar lock, ballpoint pen lock on the shutter speed dial here. So if I lock that, it won't turn. And if I unlock it, it does turn. We've got exposure compensation on the photographer's right and that gives us three stops up and three stops down. The dials are a little bit taller than on the X-T1, if I show you the back view. They are taller than on the X-T1 and they are a bit easier to turn as well and a bit more nicely finished. So this camera really is broadly similar to the X-T1 although the X-T2 is a little bigger by just a few millimetres. I'm not sure why, but every new camera does seem to put on a little bit of weight. And this one is certainly a bit fatter in this dimension. And the grip is a little larger too. We have two control wheels, one on the front here. That's configured to work shutter speed. And the one at the back is uh, dedicated to aperture. If your Fuji lens does not have an aperture ring, as this one doesn't, it has a focus ring at the front there and a zoom ring, then 
you will need to use this rear dial to set your aperture, but that's no real problem. So the controls are broadly similar to the X-T1, except I think a main one of the main differences is that the X-T2 has a little joystick here on the back, which is very useful for setting your focus point. So if I push that, you'll see that the range of focus points comes up and we can move it to whichever one we want to use. So let's keep that in the center and that is a nice handy little feature over and above the xt1 so we can see then that the fujifilm approach continues with some subtle and very useful updates for the xt2 the xt1 here is a very capable and powerful camera the xt2 is even more so now, I think one of the main reasons for the success and the popularity of these cameras is the Fujifilm film simulations. And with the exception of one, these are digital recreations, faithful digital recreations of actual Fuji film stocks. So these are authentic looks. They're not the kind of thing, they're not the same as Instagram filters or something of that sort. These are far more authentic, derived by Fuji Color scientists from Fuji Color film. Now, the only film simulation that is not based on Fuji film is the probably the most popular one, Classic Chrome. It's an absolutely beautiful simulation, and I've got to be honest, I've used little else. I think the real intention of that is to simulate something like Kodachrome and it does that magnificently. It's not called Kodachrome because of course that wasn't a Fuji film, but it does reproduce, Classic Chrome does reproduce the look of Kodachrome and the look of those old colour negatives. Now the X-T2 has a new film simulation over and above the ones that the X-T1 has, and that is Fuji Acros. It's a very sort of resonant, contrasty, black and white film simulation that is, again, directly based on Fuji Acros film. It has a lot of body. It's very rich. It's very deep. And if it's not rich and deep enough for you, you can make it more so by playing with the in-camera settings. It makes lovely, lovely black and white images and it's rather nicer than the black and whites on the X-T1. The X-T1 had a monochrome mode. It wasn't even named after a film. It was just called monochrome and then you had monochrome with filters, simulated filters. They were nice enough but a little bit weak and washed out and whenever I used them I always would pump them up to the maximum to get some contrast and some depth and some body out of them. I don't think they were the most successful film simulations on the X-T1, but this, the Acros on the X-T2 is very strong, very punchy, absolutely beautiful simulation of black and white film. And if the bundled film sims aren't enough, you can always head over to fujiweekly.com where there are recipes to cook your own Fuji films. You can go into the settings on your camera, play around with white balance, sharpness, highlight, shadows. All the settings are given on that site to reproduce the looks of films from the past and many of them are very successful very very beautiful simulations i am going to do an episode soon just purely on cooking your own film simulation so i won't go too deeply into it now but if you want to have a go all the recipes are on there absolutely fantastic resource now like most fuji x cameras or at least many Fuji X cameras, this one has no anti-aliasing filter over the sensor, so the images are inherently very, very sharp from these cameras. In fact, 
paired with a modern Fuji lens, this modern Fuji lens, this camera made some of the sharpest images I've ever seen. I have literally never seen images so sharp. It resolves a stunning level of detail. In fact, I must admit, I found it a little bit too sharp. Even using a vintage lens, I put the Helios 44 on here, and that's definitely not the sharpest lens in the world, but even so, that high level of sharpness was still there, certainly in the centre of the shot at least. So to soften it up a bit, I went into the menus and played around with the sharpness control. Menus are very accessible on here, very easy to navigate. First of all, I tried turning the sharpness down to uh, as far as it would go, to minus four, and I found that was a little too soft. So eventually I settled on minus two and found that was just about right. Um, there's also a grain control, and I put a little bit of film grain on it. The film grain control on this camera has only two settings, so I found the weak setting to be very useful to just soften up the shot just a little bit and to add some of that organic feel that does get lost with these hyper sharp images from very sharp modern lenses and sensors with no AA filter. And I found that really made the images just to my liking and they were absolutely beautiful after I'd applied that grain. I do wish there was an intermediate grain setting though because I found the weak setting perhaps just a little too weak and the strong setting just a little too strong. But I settled for the weak setting and it softened things up nicely. I found the images straight out of camera to be absolutely breathtaking. It's difficult to explain why they're so nice, but they have a smoothness. They have, what can I say, a solidity, a depth, a substance that I haven't seen in any other images. There are many other cameras that make fantastic images, but none of them, I don't think, are quite as nice as these images that come straight out of camera JPEGs. In fact, they're so nice. I've never seen images so nice. These are possibly the nicest images I've seen out of any camera. They certainly have a very, very individual, very beautiful look to them. And they are different to the images that the X-T1 makes. They do seem to have a bit more solidity. They do seem to have a little bit more depth. Now, I'm going to do a video comparing the X-T1 and the X-T2 very closely quite soon, so I'm not going to compare the images too closely here. Suffice it to say, they are different, and I know that both these cameras have very, very staunch adherence. Some swear by the X-T1 and say that later sensors uh, don't produce the same kind of image, don't produce as pleasing images. Others go for the later cameras and are very strongly um, committed to those. But the images are different. They're, they're very similar, but they're not quite the same. X-T1 images seem a little more delicate, a little bit softer, whereas the X-T2 images are definitely bolder, more resonant, more contrasty. Now, this little camera has very strong video capabilities, unlike the X-T1, which is a little bit lacking in the video department. It will shoot 1080p at 24 frames per second. This one, the X-T2, well, it shoots 1080 at 24p, 25p and 30p and also at 50 and 60p and you can record a continuous 30 minute shot uh, when you're shooting 1080. It also shoots very, very beautiful 4K footage at 24p and 25p and also at 30p. You're limited to 10 minutes with 4K but that's more than enough. 
It also has an F-log uh, file format, which is a very flat image, which is when you want to take that into edit software to grade it, to put a certain look on it, or to match it with the look from another camera. But to be honest, the video straight out of camera, the ordinary 1080, the ordinary 4K, they're both beautiful. And this camera shoots videos in the film simulations. So I really wouldn't bother with F-Log unless you really need it, unless you particularly have a desire for a certain look or you've really got to match it to a different camera. Just shoot the film simulations, 1080, 4K, absolutely beautiful video, a real strength of this camera. The bitrate for all files, all video formats, is 100 megabits per second, so there's lots of information coming through. Those are really good, fat, solid files. So there are some very useful video capabilities on this little camera, and if you're a video shooter, this is worth considering. It doesn't quite have the feature set of a more modern camera, but it's still a very capable video camera. It doesn't have any uh, in-body image stabilization. That's a very, very clever system where the sensor moves to compensate for vibrations. And not all of the Fuji lenses have stabilization built in, although many do. So if you're using a setup like this, you really would need to put this camera on a gimbal if you're doing any handheld work because otherwise you're just not going to get the steadiness of shot. If you try and handhold video with this camera, you're going to get lots of micro jitters and lots of micro jelly shutter and all sorts of things that you don't want to appear in your final images. So it's really a tripod based camera for shooting video or on a gimbal if you're going handheld and you want to move around to get that stabilization. Other than that, the quality of the video that comes out of this camera, you could shoot anything on it. An independent feature, a short, promotional or corporate videos, adverts, music videos, documentaries, whatever you want, the footage out of this camera is entirely up to the job. Now the autofocus of the X-T2 is said to be a little bit faster than the X-T1. I must say I haven't noticed, they both seem pretty quick to me. Um, I'm sure there is a fraction of a second improvement, but I really didn't notice it, and I think you're unlikely to notice it yourself in everyday use. Both cameras struggle a little bit in low light, uh, that is very low light, but that's inherent in mirrorless cameras because of the focus systems that they use. Having said that, they're both pretty reasonable in low light. I think the X-T2 is slightly better, but both of them will, given a little extra time and a little extra effort, find a focus point for you, uh, unless the light is um, practically non-existent. There are three focus settings on the front of the camera. I'll just demonstrate over here. And you can see we have a little little tiny control here for single focus, continuous focus and manual focus. So you have a choice of those three settings. That little button's in a very nice, convenient, easy to find place when you've got the camera to your eye. I did use the continuous setting for shooting the few casual video shots that I took. Um, I just took them really just for this uh, episode just to make clear the kind of video it can shoot and of course you wouldn't usually use electronic focus, you wouldn't usually use autofocus in uh, video shooting. However, I did, and this lens, while it's focusing, it did a reasonable job of focusing, but it's pretty noisy. You can hear it hunting between focus positions. You can hear the motors turning. So this lens is 
pretty noisy. As I say, you wouldn't usually use autofocus on video, but if you do, watch out for a little bit of motor noise from the lens. Now, when you're using manual focus, when you're shooting video or when you're using a vintage lens, perhaps, then you're going to need focusing aids. Unfortunately, the X-T2 has some very good ones. The first one is focus peaking, which is um, a system that gives whatever you're focusing on a highlight when it's in focus. And this camera has red, white and blue peaking options. I tend to use the red because it's most visible in most situations. It has a digital split image which is exactly what it says. It's uh, a patch that appears on the screen or in the viewfinder that much like the old rangefinders or the prism in an SLR gives you a split image which moves side to side and when it's joined up then you're focused. I don't think that's as effective as peaking. It's useful if you've got lots of vertical lines in your shot, but I don't find it as useful as peaking. It will appear either in monochrome or in colour. So if you're shooting in colour, it's a good idea to use it in black and white. It deline delineates your focus area very well. And if you're shooting in black and white, then you can set it to colour with the same result. You can see more clearly what you're focusing on. The best focusing aid is the magnified centre, uh, what Fuji call the dual image. And that's where you get uh, an image of the main scene and just next to it on your right, you get a, a magnified, very highly magnified square from the centre of the frame. So you can check your focus very, very accurately. And that's available in the viewfinder or on the rear screen. And that's a really useful thing. I use that all the time when I'm shooting the old vintage lenses on these cameras. Very useful indeed. So there we are. That is the fantastic little Fuji X-T2. It shoots beautiful still images with the Fuji lenses, the beautiful Fuji lenses, or pretty much any manual film lens. It shoots beautiful, beautiful video. And it's a lovely, lovely camera. I must admit, I think I'm falling in love with these X cameras. They really are fantastic. No other manufacturer makes cameras quite like these. The degree of thought that's gone into them, the love that's gone into them, the desire to reproduce the best elements of the old film cameras has all gone into these little Fuji X cameras. And I am a fan. Now, as regards price, when this camera was new, not that long ago, in, what, 2016, thereabouts, five years ago, when it was new, this camera cost £1,600. Right now, there are lots of very nice condition used X-T2s around, and you can buy a Minter, an absolutely flawless specimen, an as new camera for around about £400, as I did with this one. I paid about £400 for this one. The chap who I bought it from told me that it was just like new. He'd hardly used it. It was still in its box with all its packaging. And when it arrived, he, he spoke absolutely the truth. I, I couldn't really tell this from a brand new camera. So these really are bargains at the moment. And if you want one, there's no better time than now to grab one. So that's it from me for now. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. And if you like the content on this channel and you'd like to support it and help it grow and develop, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As ever, thank you very much for watching 
and I will see you next time for some more xenography.